We are thrilled to be here with you. And in case you thought that the participation part of this event for the morning was over, think again, because we're going back at it. Chip and I have a question for you, and it involves a little bit of math. Okay, starting at the age of 18, think about how long you think you're likely to live. We both think we're gonna live to 98. And then calculate what percentage of your adult life do you have left to live? So figure that out. And then we're gonna start our little timer here now for three minutes. And with that number, find someone who was not your partner in this previous conversation that Michelle engaged you in, and share a little bit about your number and what that means to you. And we'll call you back in just a moment. Great job. Great job. Okay. So, Chip. Yes, Karen. It's, first of all, it's an honor to be up here with you and to be with all of you. Uh, thank you. Absolutely. I'm thrilled to be here with you as well. So, when you ask yourself that question, what percentage of your adult life is remaining? So, the reason this question is somewhat provocative is because uh, I, I'm 57, I turn 58 next week. Um, and if I do the real math and, and the lo this longevity online site said I was gonna live until I was 98, and that would mean, frankly, I'm not even at half time of my adult life yet. Mm -hmm. As of 58, I'll be at half time. And I was scuba diving with my 81 year old father a few months ago, <laughs> and he thinks he's gonna live until 98 too. It's sort of, a, there's, there's a theme here. Um, and he's barely in the fourth quarter of his adult life. So when you think that way, you start imagining, I started learning how to surf last year um, at age 56. So you start to think of the second half of your life with a, a new perspective of freshness and you know, trying new things. Mm -hmm. So our session is called The Making <coughs> of a Modern Elder, as is your recent book, by the way, the subtitle, The New Modern Elder. So is it that kind of thinking about this um, 
extended adult life that led you to begin thinking about a modern elder? And may I just ask what the heck? What is a heck modern you know? elder? Do you want to be a modern elder? I don't know. <laughs> Am I a um, modern elder? <laughs> is uh, that a good are. thing? I think, so I think, first of all, uh, I, I'm not saying modern elderly. That's different. Thank um, you. And I'm not saying elderly is a bad thing, but I actually think there, you know, if we're gonna live a lot longer, and there's all kinds of data that shows this, um, even forgetting about the, you know, what the Silicon Valley gurus are doing to create like, a, 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 you know, no death in the future. Um, but long story short is, I think that if we are gonna live a lot longer, there's a period of our life where we're an elder before we're elderly. But in the past, uh, we, we thought of elders with reverence, but to me today, it's all about relevance. So we're moving from reverence to relevance in order to be relevant as an elder. Uh, and I think elder is a, a relative term. If you're a 40 year old surrounded with 25 year olds, you're an elder, truly. And that's Silicon Valley, what I just described, 40 years old, 40 year olds tr surrounded by 25 year olds. Um, so be, to be relevant means you actually need to take your timeless wisdom or the and apply it to modern day problems, mm -hmm. which means I think a modern elder is as much an intern as they are a mentor. And my experience that led me to this was the last five and a half years being with the founders of Airbnb and uh, you know, average age in the company of about 26 or 27 and to be twice that age and to realize that I was an elder in that group. Well, I love the reclaiming of the, the elder part of elder. The word, yes. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. So one of the things that you talk about in your book that really struck me is uh, that you don't necessarily see or read about a correlation yeah. between age and wisdom. Yeah. And we all know examples, right, of <laughs> wise, <laughs> relatively younger people and not so wise, relatively older people. Yeah. So we know well, that- we, won't know, we will name no names, but yes, yeah. <laughs> but no names, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but all, we all know examples on both ends of that. Yes, so yes. they don't necessarily go together. And yet, as you enter this modern elder phase, yes. Um, one of the things that you have to offer and that's a differentiator is wisdom, potentially, yeah. if you have it. So what are some of the kinds of things that we can do in the course of our lives, including as we enter this modern elder phase, that increase our, our wisdom, which therefore potentially increases what we have to offer? So first, let's define wisdom. And, and it's a Good really idea. hard thing to define. You go out and watch, do a, do a Google search on wisdom and you'll find a lot of definitions. My definition of it is, Good judgment based upon pattern recognition uh, with a healthy uh, combination of confidence and doubt. And so if I were to unpack those three, confidence and doubt is a really interesting piece of this. I think mm -hmm. the older you get, the more you don't know uh, a variety of things. And a lot of younger people have a lot of hubris, especially in Silicon Valley, um, because that's actually how they go raise money. Uh, and so I think there's an element of learning that there's times you up the ante on the confidence and then there's other times you up the ante on the doubt. Um, pattern recognition is probably the, maybe the, the most common element of wisdom that people talk about, which means that you can see the underlying pattern of things and it gives you an intuitive sense of what, the, where, how things are gonna turn out. The longer you've been on the planet, the more patterns you've seen. And so that actually works to your favor, frankly, as you're older, but you actually have to be learning along the way. And then good judgment is really what comes out of that. Um, so I guess what I would just say is my experience, 10 years ago, I had a flatline experience. I actually died and uh, probably had an allergic reaction to an antibiotic. Uh, and I was, I was on stage like I am now. <laughs> Fortunately, I was sitting. Please don't die. Yeah, I, I <laughs> promise no deja vu here. Um, <laughs> and I uh, won't go through all the details, but um, other than to say, it forced me to get really clear about uh, what gave me meaning in my life. And I distilled Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, down to an equation. Despair equals suffering minus meaning. And when I upped the meaning, the despair went down. So the thing I did during a very difficult time in my life for about a two, two, three year period is every week at the end of the week, I would write down what I'd learned that week. Mm. It was just writing it down. The act of, and practice of writing down what I learned that week gave me a sense of meaning. And that meaning was almost like fuel what I didn't think at the time and realize is that process of cultivating and harnessing wisdom is what I was doing. I was actually creating the pattern recognition of what I'd learned that week. And even if I wasn't referring to that list anytime in the future, it had made an imprint on me. Mm -hmm. 
That's, that's a, great, a great practice. Thank yeah. you for sharing yeah. that. So as you think about that, the cultivating wisdom, which can really happen at, at any at age, age and hopefully yeah. happens at any age, and in your joie de vivre days, you were, you were an elder of a sort yeah. there, certainly by position, if not always by age, but by the end of it by age. But it sounds like it was really after that that you um, doubled down on this kind of identity yep. um, in part because of your Airbnb experience yes. and, um, and in, par in part because of what was happening outside of that in the rest of your life. Interesting. Do you want to say anything no, about that? No, go ahead. So in your book, you talk a lot about the importance of both qu questions and listening. And yes. you, you kind of come back to both in multiple places yeah. in terms of a way to demonstrate wisdom and, and actually add really contribute, really add yes. value in the workplace. And I, and I love that you talk about both of those. And one of the things that you highlight around asking questions that I particularly enjoyed was you talk about not using questions as a hammer. Oh, yes, yeah. And, um, and that's an interesting one because when you're, if you imagine using questions to demonstrate what you know, right. um, or just using questions to demonstrate what's a potential flaw and that could really be problematic. It doesn't yep. come from malintent necessarily, but not using questions as a hammer was, is a very memorable one. And I wanted to ask you to um, go a little bit farther on some sure. of your advice around both questions and listening, because I think there's some good tips in there for all of us at any age in our elder sphere. So the thing that I ask myself, I've learned this over time, that I always ask uh, when I'm working with someone who's maybe younger than me, first of all, mutual mentorship is the future. Mm -hmm. Wisdom does not go in just one direction. It goes in both, the physics goes in both directions today. And there's a lot I can learn from someone younger than me. And I did at Airbnb and a lot, hopefully a lot they can learn from me. But the first question I ask myself is how do I, how can I serve? And, and I try to understand what it is that they're looking for. Sometimes someone, a younger person may be looking for um, a performance. They're looking to improve their performance. In other cases, it's more of a development issue. If it's a performance issue where they're, like, they're looking for me to transfer knowledge, that's one thing. If instead they're actually looking for me to facilitate awareness, which is around development as opposed to performance, then there's a whole different approach. So uh, there's a great old saying, knowledge speaks and wisdom listens. Mm -hmm. um, and that, based upon that dichotomy, I will determine whether I'm gonna be speaking more or listening more. If I'm in the uh, transferring knowledge, I'm probably going to speak a little bit more. I'm going to, they're asking, how do I improve my sales numbers? Or how do I, you know, uh, do this or that? And, and they're looking for me to transfer knowledge. Um, and, but what I really appreciate is when, I, when someone's looking to facilitate awareness and looking for a development process. And uh, how do I, how can I be more emotionally intelligent as a leader? Uh, that's a big, important question. And that you know, the, one of the, a lot of people don't know that the reason that the owl is perceived as the wisest animal or bird in the forest is because it has the most attuned listening skill. So wisdom and listening have a lot to do with each other. And I think the process of listening not just to the story, but for the story, which allows us to get holistic and system, systemic kind of thinking toward the person I'm listening to. Um, you know, one of the things that we don't know about is that you know, we hear a lot about as we get older, our recall is not as good, our memory is not as good, we're not as fast in terms of things. But one thing that a lot of people don't know about the adult brain is as it gets older, you learn how to do all wheel drive. And what that means is you can go left, you do the left brain, right brain tango much more easily, which means you can go from left to right brain more adeptly. In so doing, you can actually speak and get the gist of something more quickly it's where the intuition and the gut instinct sort of kicks in. And so what I often do when I'm talking to someone who really wants the facilitating of awareness is I sometimes will tell the person, I'm gonna close my eyes for a few minutes as I'm listening to you, promise you I'm not taking a nap. Um, <laughs> but I just wanna actually sort of sort through what I'm, what's coming, coming to me. And I often really trust that sense of, um, of almost the intuition speaking to me and uh, knowing that there's a bit of pattern recognition that I'm, I'm tapping into. And so li giving it a full body listen, trying to get the gist of something, try to listen for the story, not just to the story, 
All those things to me help uh, me to facilitate some awareness for that person in a way they wouldn't have otherwise. Mm -hmm. it's, and I love the for the story, not to the story. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, it sort of brings up this whole full body listening as you describe it. Fun fact, owls have no sense of smell. So perhaps their listening Interesting. helps them pick up things that Oh, wow. And didn't know uh, that. Who knows? So perhaps as our sense of smell decreases as we age, well, yeah. our listening, mm -hmm. just saying. I like it. Could be there, absolutely. Um, interesting. So a lot of what you're teaching us in your book and a lot of what you experienced had to do with how you can, um, in a sense, channel your own growth toward a path of wisdom, toward this um, blend of mentor and intern, the mentorn as you describe it. Yep. Um, but you also talk about the role of the organization um, and the thing, some of the things that companies can do to increase the likelihood that this kind of exchange will, will happen and given our demographics that will increase the likelihood that as organizations we can actually take advantage of the full workforce. Yep. Um, so tell me two Two Com tips for companies. Or organizations? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I, I, you know, Google does something interesting that I think a lot of companies could do, but in a different way. So Google has the 20% time such that uh, engineers who apply and, and want to focus on an innovative project for the company mm -hmm. can do so um, and, and allocate 20% of the time. It turns out it's more like 100% plus 20% plus from what I've heard, but you know, who knows? I mean, it's, they can actually, they're given the space to do that. Wouldn't it be interesting if we asked in our employee surveys, who in the company has wisdom? Who do you look to as a role model other than your boss? And then you start to gather a list of people in the company who have that kind of institutional wisdom. And you might actually then, as a company, approach those collection of people um, and just say, are you interested in s reducing your scope a little bit and actually becoming an in-house coach, mentor, someone who actually helps facilitate um, new ideas in innovation kind mm -hmm. of ways, someone actually who's a cultural um, uh, ambassador to the organization for new employees, such that you, in essence, create modern elders within the organization. Uh, Procter & Gamble has a, had a mastery program for 50 years now that does sort of that. So that's one, I'd say that's one example. Another one is, frankly, in Silicon Valley, companies need to create ERGs, employee resource groups, for older people. I mean, we have them for people of color and, and gender and, and sexual orientation, et cetera, but a lot of organizations don't actually focus on their older employees and listen to them and say, you know, a lot of older employees would like to not go from full time on a Friday to no time on a Monday. They'd actually love a process of retiring over the course of five years. And so all that institutional wisdom doesn't leave one day. So being able to tap into that group as a group, mm -hmm. and then finally mutual mentorship. I mean, the ways that we allow and create the conditions for intergenerational collaboration to flow in a new way um, is really, I think, the future now that we have five generations in the workplace at the same time. Which is just mind-boggling, by the way, five generations yeah. at one time. I know you're entertained by the name of our employee resource group, so I'll share it publicly. The Greglers. The Google Greglers. The Greglers. Yes. And then there's a subgroup of us who also are the WCA, the women of a certain age. <laughs> you, know, you just got to own it. It's all you can do. You just got to own it. So while we're talking about then employee resource groups and other dimensions of diversity, in a sense, you, know, you're, you, you have been focusing deeply on ageism and age opportunity. opportunity. Yep. Um, but I it seems to me that some of the principles that you identified and some of the, the truths and barriers that you ran into are relevant on any number of dimensions yep. of diversity. And how, did that come up for you? Um, what can we learn from what you've experienced and what you're touring about now um, related to diversity more broadly? I think the best thing anybody could ever have in their life is to be the other. Like, just be the other, especially for those of us who are white males in, in a dominant, power-wise, white male society. Be the other. I, when I was in high school, I was the other. I went to Snoop Dogg's high school. I was 10 years older than him, but it was an inner city school in LA. And that was like, I was very much the minority. So I was the other. Um, I'm a gay man. And in, in college, I was in a fraternity and, and played on a college water polo team and was not out. I was the other. Mm. I, at Airbnb, I was the other. I was twice the age of the average employee. The, real, the value in being the other is it allows you to have empathy for the other 
and we need a lot more empathy for the other in this world. And so I, I think, and I think one of the elements that is more and more getting attention, which I think is really important, is the idea of cognitive diversity. The idea that you teams should look demographically diverse, but they also should look cognitively diverse because that means you have less you know, thinking with everybody thinking alike. Um, and one of the beauties about having an age diverse team with older people is um, our older brains work differently than younger brains. And that's a beautiful thing on a team because you can actually learn from each other that way. So yes, I think you know, getting into the, the shoes of the other is essential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We certainly dove into that experience. So let's, we're at a mindfulness conference, let's bring mindfulness into this. Um, yes. How does this, how, do, how is mindfulness related? And you've blended these two by creating this um, mindful wisdom elder academy. Modern elder um. academy. <laughs> I, I'm really like doubling down on that damn name, modern elder. Um, <laughs> so the modern elder academy, so I was writing this book about a year and a half ago in Mexico where I live in Baja, California, about an hour north of Cabo San Lucas. Um, and I'm, t I'm, I'm telling my story in the book, but I, I interviewed about 150 people in midlife. And what I just heard over and over again was the bewilderment and anxiety that they felt about the future. They're gonna live longer, but power is moving younger. And that's truth. I mean, they're gonna live 10, maybe 15 years longer than their parents, but there's a lot of uh, truth that shows that power is actually moving younger in a digital society. So what we've done is we've created a, a 20 or 30 year irrelevancy gap in midlife. And we generally in society have done the following when people are going through transitions in life. We've actually, cre we create rituals, rites of passage and celebrations for people. Puberty, you have, uh, bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, quinceanera. Uh, from adolescence to adulthood, you graduate from something and you have a commencement ceremony. You're gonna get married, you have a wedding. You're gonna have a baby, you have a baby shower. You're gonna die, you have a funeral, but between baby shower and funeral, nada, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> But it made sense because back in 1900, the average longevity in the US was 47. So midlife was 24. So 77 by the year 2000, we added three decades of life to the average American in one century. Midlife crisis as a term was coined in 1965 and it is 53 years later and we still done nothing to solve that other than to make it longer because I think midlife now is from <laughs> 35 to 75 because we felt irrelevant earlier and we've, we're gonna work longer. So long story short, as I said, what if I had created this you know, first, world's first midlife wisdom school where people actually are able to navigate midlife transitions? There's a huge amount of transitions in life uh, and a lot of them are in midlife. You may lose your parents, you may lose a spouse, you, know, you may get divorced, you may change your job or career or where you live, you, be, may, you may become an empty nester if you have kids. You'll go through menopause, or men will go through andropause, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't have any social crucible to help people with that. So called it the Modern Elder Academy, did it in a beta program. It's one of the things I learned about tech is you call things beta when, when you have lots of mistakes. And, <laughs> and so mistakes don't count. We did a lot of, yeah, so we did that the first half of this year, and it went really well. 153 people went through week-long and two-week-long programs. And, and it's a social enterprise, so 50% of the people are on scholarship because the real beauty and joy to me was watching a social worker and an investment banker go for a walk on the beach and come back crying and laughing at the same time and they've learned from each other. So um, it opens to the public in uh, two weeks. Yeah, two weeks from yesterday. So um, check it out. Yeah, and it's, and we, like, we use nature as a teacher. Just one last thought. We do a variety of things that are experiential where people learn things we learn how to rock balance. Have you ever seen people rock balance, be the beauty of artwork, like rock balancing? Mm -hmm. Well, balancing a rock and actually getting used to like saying, okay, this stone is part of a bigger stone and you actually match make that little stone with the big stone. And when you're rock balancing and putting, you actually sort of hold the rock and you listen for the still point. And there's a click of equilibrium where you take your hands away and that vertical rock is standing on another rock. That is mentorship. That's what happens when you're actually mentoring someone and they are connecting with their calling. And if you do that well, um, they actually stand up. And so we take nature and use it as a teacher for us to understand what does it mean to be an elder. And what role does mindfulness play at the academy but also in your life and your own journey? 
we have um, a place uh, called Parque del Alma. It's a half acre sand dune. Um, it's a contemplation park. It's exclusive, it's all silent, exclusive place where you can sit on benches, literally on the beach, watching the, the whales breach, um, seeing the sea turtles come in and actually lay their eggs. Um, and that's right there. Uh, so Parque de Alma is right there. We have mindfulness um, uh, classes, uh, meditation, yoga, et cetera. So, but it's not exclusively a mindfulness in the sense of training. It's, 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 mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, that's sort of the foundational piece of it. Mm -hmm. And for me on a personal level, it's, uh, yeah, it's my morning and my evening meditation that uh, helps me. And it's occasionally going and doing a Vipassana retreat with people like Mark Coleman. If anybody, you know Mark Coleman? He wrote a book called Awake in the Wild. It's beautiful about, you know, I go, I go for a week kayaking and meditating in the Sea of Cortez with whales. And for a week we're silent and we're just pitching our tent and we're just literally in nature. And so that's another thing I do. So it sounds like a long, a long and important practice to you. Listen, well. it's it's part of what helps me on a book tour <laughs> like this one. <laughs> so Good. it's great to be here. Well, thank you for inviting us into what could be a very exciting uh, more than second half of for many of us of uh, the rest of our adult lives, and for for really kind of pulling back the curtain on what's possible um, for the modern elder phase. Thank so you. Thank, thank you. you. For your work. And have a great day, everybody. Enjoy it. Mm-hmm.